family's kind of a, I'm a mutt of a lot of different influences. Um, my mother was a French ballerina, and uh, I think my first exposure to music was in utero. When she was pregnant of me, she was visiting her family in France, and she went to see this movie Black Orpheus, and she just fell in love with Brazilian music. My uncle was a piano player. My mother's father was also a piano player, so there was a lot of music around. So my mom had seen Black Orpheus. She fell in love with Brazilian music. When she came back, she was just telling all her friends. She had a friend who knew this guy who was the con who had just been appointed as the consulate to Brazil, stationed in LA. So this guy, Raul, would call up my mom and say, oh, Jobim's in town, let's have a party. So she, they would have, my parents would have a party and the Brazilian musicians would come over. We had a musician named Les Baxter who lived across the street, who was sort of the king of exotica music. Then he would bring his friends, who were like Henry Mancini and Pete Rugolo, sort of these prominent Hollywood arrangers. They would come by to meet the Brazilians. So our house was like this sort of meeting ground. So at some point, Sergio Mendes had come over to our house, and my dad said to him, look, you know, anytime you want to come and use our house to rehearse, feel free. So I think from 64 and 65, they rehearsed in our house. Even though my parents played piano, no one in my family played guitar, so I was kind of left to figure it out on my own. But that's the instrument I was drawn to, probably because of the Beatles. This actor, Larry Hagman, had a house in Malibu that was always a hotbed of different people coming and going. And as kids, we were always hanging out there. And I remember I was sitting there on the porch playing this guitar, and this hippie guy came over and he said, hey, you want to learn to play the blues? And he showed me this blues thing. Well, it was Peter Fonda, and the song he showed me was The Pusher Man from Easy Rider. Probably the most inappropriate song to teach a nine-year-old. When I was like 14, I was really into John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. And so I wanted to learn to play jazz. That's what I thought jazz was. You know, I wanted to improvise fast. And my dad said, well, why don't you call Barney Kessel and see if he'll give you lessons? So I called the union and I got his number and I called him up <laughs> and he was laughing. He heard this little kid, you know, and he said, well, I, you know, I won't, I don't teach, but here's the number of this guy who's a great teacher. So he gave me Jimmy Weibel's number. I was a terrible student, but he showed me some really great picking technique and he got my scales and stuff going. They talk about when a man gets old, he's through. Well, that's a doggone lie and I can prove it to you. The worst thing I ever did in my life was the day I let Grandpa see my wife. Grandpa's the most important thing was I got turned on to the music he had come up with. He was a Western swing guitar hero. He was in uh, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys on um, some of their seminal recordings. He went on to play with Spade Cooley, Tex Williams. He also um, then later joined Benny Goodman's band, and he was a phenomenal jazz player. In the 80s, around the time I was trying to be an actor and things weren't going very well, I needed a job. and. Um, this friend of mine told me that this diner in Silver Lake was hiring dishwashers. The guy who owned it, he was obsessed with the 30s. He had like a picture of FDR on the wall. He, had, he drove an old Indian motorcycle and he listened to a lot of Western swing music. Well, at some point he found out that I had had lessons with Jimmy Weibel. And he said, hey, I need a guitar player in my band. I have a Western swing band. I said. Okay, you know, I'll give it a shot. He also was one of the people who booked um, the Hong Kong Cafe, which was sort of 
a punk rock venue downtown LA. So I joined this band and I remember we opened for X at the Palace, which was a huge thing for me, sort of the biggest show I'd ever played. And uh, it was a couple nights and I remember at the end of the second night, one of the guys from the Blasters came up and asked me if I'd be interested in auditioning for the Blasters, which was sort of a huge uh, LA punk rockabilly band. They were from Orange County, so you had to learn surf, surf guitar. They also grew up with Big Joe Turner and T-Bone Walker, so I had to learn all this classic swing blues guitar. And then the rockabilly stuff. So I was listening to like Bill Haley and um, all the Sun Records. And so I got into that band. I, I still don't really know how I managed, but I guess I was just lucky. And there were a couple really great things that came about from that. Besides being able to quit my job as a dishwasher, I got to play with one of the great tenor sax players of rock and roll, this guy Lee Allen. He had played most of the solos on Little Richard and Fats Domino's big hits, Lloyd Price. He was on a lot of these records out of New Orleans in the 50s. And so I got to tour with him and travel with him and, and he would invite me to jam sessions in South Central LA with all these other old guys. Lee was like a mentor for me, really a father figure in many ways. But musically, he said some things which I'll never forget. One of the things he said, because the Blasters had a lot of fast tempos, you know, really like, and, and when you're playing a fast tempo and it's time to solo, you just think you gotta play a lot of fast stuff. But that's not a very musical thing. And if you listen to Lee's solos on the Little Richard records, which are really frantic, he'll always play some beautiful idea, leave a big space, and then res resolve it. And so he, he said, don't, don't worry about all that noise. Let them do that. You just play something pretty. And I watched him every night do that. And he would make the... There weren't a lot of ladies at those blaster shows, but if there were, the ones that were there, he would make them all go crazy because he just, with that tenor saxophone, he just knew how to just play something really warm and sexy while we're all just like raging, you know, and he's like simple and easy. After about three years of touring with the Blasters, that takes us into the early 90s, and Lee Allen started getting sick. He had cancer, and he stopped being able to tour. And at that point, I felt like the, the band was a little bit dysfunctional, and I was starting to suffer from it. Um, so I decided it was time to leave. And it, it was a hard thing to walk away from a band like that. At the same time, I started doing occasional gigs as a duet with John Doe. And so um, I started doing more of that. At the same time as I was doing that, I was still uh, trying to do the R&B swing stuff. I spent um, about a month in the band Canned Heat. <laughs> I had known Joey Warnaker for a while, and for a while he was the drummer in the Radio Ranch Straight Shooters. He was the first drummer in that band. Joey started getting more and more work with Beck, and it was right around the time that Beck's first album came out. And then he asked me to come and audition for Beck, and um, I was pretty excited because I had heard Loser, a friend of mine had the single, and I just thought it was so groundbreaking. And so, you know, I was so excited I went and met Beck, but he couldn't really decide whether he wanted to use me or not, so I missed that tour because I had another tour. He waited too long. So the following year when Odelay came out, um, I got asked to audition again, and basically I just showed up and we started playing. I think the biggest crowd I had played for with the Blasters was like 2,500 people. You know, on the Odelay tour, we found ourselves playing for festivals for like 70,000 people. And it was like a whole other 
ball game. And it was great because Beck was really on the rise. He was on the cover of all the magazines. We did all the talk shows. We did Saturday Night Live a few times. I mean, it was incredible. It was my, my dream come true. And I was already in my late 30s at the time, so I felt like, oh, you know, someone's going to find out how old I am and, like, fire me. But it never happened. <laughs> so through Beck, um, a lot of doors opened for me. The funny thing was I had already met Rick Rubin because one of the blues bands I played in was on his label, and so we had already done some work together. But after having worked for Beck, then I think Rick was more inclined to call me up because it was easier to sell me to the artists. And one day I'm walking by this room and I see, I look in, I see Joe Strummer sitting on the floor cross-legged with all these sheets of paper. I'm like, for, I did a double take. I was like, really? Joe Strummer? So I would go into the control room and I said, Rick, you know, Joe Strummer's in the other room. He's like, oh yeah, Smokey, go in there and help him finish that song. So I'm like, okay. So I walk in, I'm, hi, I'm Smokey. And he's like, Oh, and he pops up and he's like, shakes my hand. He's like, hi, I'm, I'm Joe. And uh, he said, I say, oh, well, Rick told me to help you finish the song. Oh, that's great. That's great. What's your name again? I said, Smokey. He said, Smokey? Smokey Hormel. He's like, okay, here, write it down. Write down Hormel Strummer. No, no, no. Write down Strummer Hormel. <laughs> So I put our names on the lyric sheet. That's the kind of guy he was. I hadn't done a thing. He was giving me writing credit on his song. All I said was, I'm here to help you <laughs> write the song. The way I deal with my own nervousness when I go into a session with a, an artist who I'm intimidated by, maybe, is to remember that it's not about me. It's about them. I'll give you an example. It, it, uh, a good one was with Johnny Cash because, you know, it's Johnny Cash. And I remember the first session I did with him, um, it was right after he'd signed to Rick's label and Rick was having him work with a lot of different bands. June walked in the room first and she immediately engaged us in conversation. So that was easy. She's a great icebreaker. But with Mr. Cash, you could tell he... You know, it was a whole new group of people he didn't know. He was a little nervous about this producer because he hadn't worked with Rick very long. So as soon as we knew what the first song was, all that went away and we just focused on the song and figuring out how we could make the song fit to his voice and what was going to reflect best for him. Um, that was in the early 90s, and then I continued to work with him um, later in the late 90s and up until he died. And at that point, his health was so bad, it was all about just getting him comfortable and making sure that his voice had enough space. So he, he needed a certain amount of support so he could feel the song, but it had to be very minimal so, because his voice was so weak. He needed room, so you had to support him but stay out of the way. It was a challenge, but you, you forgot that he was Johnny Cash. He was just this guy trying to tell the story. There were times when he would do the vocals with us, but a lot of the time, he, he because of his health, he only had a short window of a couple hours where he could really have the energy to sing. So what we would do is, we would figure out what the key and the tempo was for him, and then we'd work with Rick to create the basic track, and then the next day he would come back and sing on it. But when we were doing the basic tracks, we needed a guide vocal. So I, I think it was Hurt was the first one where Rick said, Smokey, you sing it. I was like, what, you want me to sing it? He's like, well, if you don't do it, I'll do it. I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I did the guide vocal for him, and then he had that to work with overnight. So he didn't have to make the trans the transition from the Trent Reznor version. He, 
he had a vocal with that track so he could get comfortable with it. And I remember the next day he came back and he just nailed it. It was like one take and we were just all floored, like, oh my God, this, he really understood the song. And, it, and I had a really um, cathartic experience because for a while in my early 20s, I was studying acting and theater. And it really paid off because when I was with Mr. Cash, I had to really figure out his cadence and, and how much breath he had. Because if I was going to do a guide vocal, I had to do it as close to his voice as possible. And um, I was really lucky I had some of that acting training because that all sort of came into play. The weird thing was that after he died, I didn't want to stop. I just wanted to keep singing. I never really felt like a singer before, but it, after that experience, I felt like I had to keep going. So that's why I started the Roundup. And that's why I still do it every week at Sunny's.